witnessed in tackling a particularly difficult problem using Haskell and QuickCheck. And it, it was really amazing. And I thought, wow, if we could learn how to do that, that would be a real leap in productivity. We're trying to learn how to do it. And uh, you'll hear, you will hear some testimony afterwards by Graham Crow, from who, well, he gets to present himself, but he used to work for the RBS and they have been using QuickCheck. So first, John, with a talk on QuickCheck, and then a voice of reason from the real world, the one we live in. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that. <laughs> OK, thank you, Will. My voice sounds strange, so I assume you can hear me. So this is a talk about an application of functional programming, an application of functional programming to testing. And uh, I just want to start off by emphasizing that um, testing really is a big deal. So this is more or less the proportion of the cost of a software development project that is usually spent on testing. This is a rough figure. You can see everything from 30% up to about 80%. But it's a lot. And I really don't have to tell you that. You all know how much effort Ericsson devotes to uh, testing your products. And uh, you also know how to do it in the state of the art. So uh, surprisingly many companies that still do all their software testing manually. And uh, some, will, some will tell you, testing, we let our customers do that. <laughs> Nevertheless, if you're taking a very professional approach to the matter, as Ericsson does, then you'll be using test automation. You have your software under test. You have a, a large collection of automated test cases. And there'll be some kind of test server that uh, runs those test cases frequently, maybe every night, uh, generating a report of the test case failures. Maybe every night, and maybe every time you check in a modification to the code. At any rate, the idea is that you have a large number of tests and uh, if you screw up, then you find out very rapidly. And then a, a refinement to the basic idea of having a lot of automated test cases is just every time a new bug is reported, then you add a test case uh, to the suite that will reveal just that bug. And uh, just to, again, illustrate the scale of these things, here's a project for which I happen to know some figures, thanks to Hove, um, Ericsson's AXT301. And there, the actual control software is about one and a half million lines of airline code. And the test cases are another 700,000 lines of code. So the point of this is just to stress that an awful lot of effort goes into uh, automated testing. But there are reasons not to be entirely satisfied with the present state of the art. So this is a figure that comes from the American Department of Defense, and it's approximately how many errors remain in delivered software. More or less one <coughs> error per 100 lines of code, despite careful testing. Yes, 10 errors per 1,000 lines of code. Roughly speaking, again, this figure varies a little bit from application domain to application domain, but it's of that order. This is quite a lot of errors, really. I mean, if you think of that one and a half million lines of airline code, then you would expect um, 15,000 errors to remain in it, despite uh, careful testing. And software errors in general, they still cause problems for all of us, which we have all experienced, and which I hope to escape on this laptop during this presentation, but I'm not sure that I will. Here is the annual cost of the US economy of software errors. And this comes from a congressional report in 2002. And it's easy to look at this figure and think of things like the Ariane rocket blowing up. But um, it's more things like, you know, word crashes and you lose an hour of work. Um, there are quite large costs caused by that kind of minor irritation. Um, just like the common coal causes uh, enormous uh, costs to the economy. So $60 billion is a lot of money. It's $200 for every man, woman, and child in the USA uh, every year. So we would really like to improve um, the quality of 
software that is produced. Actually, there's another reason for being a little unsatisfied with automated testing. And that is that this is the percentage of errors that automated testing actually finds. That is, 85% of errors are found the first time a test case is run. Well, in that case, there wasn't any point automating it. You would have found those 85% of errors with manual testing. All that test automation that so much work goes into, that's for finding the last 15% of the errors. Um, Ulf always tells me, that's OK, because it's the most embarrassing 15% of errors. It's the errors that your customers have already reported to you. Um, no doubt that's true. But nevertheless, uh, it's clear that this isn't a, a complete solution for the problem of uh, software testing. So the question is, can we do better? Can we test software with lower costs and end up with better quality? And that's what we're trying to do with QuickCheck. How? Well, by replacing traditional automated test cases by what we call properties instead. So a traditional test case will typically exercise the software in one particular case. And it contains a specification of what the correct behavior of the software is for that specific case. For example, it may contain the ex expected output from the system, which you then compare against the actual output and see if you get what you expect. In contrast, a property um, covers many cases at once. And it has to specify the correct behavior in any of the cases that the property refers to. So the, the re result of that is that properties are much more general than test cases. We can hope to write much more concise test code by writing properties instead, because each property will cover many individual test cases. And yet, because a property covers many cases at once, we're going to be able to generate test cases from properties and end up testing many more test cases than can reasonably be tested by writing each one separately. OK, that's the general idea. Enough talk. Let's see an example. Um, I'm going to show you using QuickCheck to test uh, an SMS encoding function. So. Um, I'm sure many of you know much more about SMS encoding than I do, but uh, let me explain it nevertheless. <coughs> the messages that you send in SMS, the characters that you send in SMS messages, are actually seven-bit characters. But they're transmitted in packets made up of eight-bit bytes. So there's an opportunity to pack eight characters into seven bytes. And the SMS standard says that you should do that packing. So it's done in the obvious way that you take the seven bits from the first character and you put them into seven bits of the first byte, and then you take one bit of the next character and you put that into the first byte, and the other six in the next one, and so on, and so on and so forth. And um, I'm going to test uh, a packing and an unpacking function that map to and fro between these two representations. So let me find my code. Here it is. This is an implementation of that packing method in Erlang. Uh, we got this from a company in Paris. So this is not our code. Here is the pack function. And um, well, you can see it's quite complicated. It's making use of Erlang's uh, facilities for manipulating binary values, which makes it simpler to express than it might otherwise be. But nevertheless, there's quite a lot of it. We don't need to look at the details of this. It will be packed here. OK, so we got this software together with a test suite. Here it is. Um, <laughs> we test it on a, a wide variety of different strings, lots of different lengths. Um, not every possible character has, but nevertheless. We're going to be running quite a lot of tests there. And uh, what does the test do? Well, it takes the string S, packs it, and unpacks it, binds that to T, and then it just checks whether or not s is equal to t. And uh, that final statement is a, a pattern match. If s and t are different, then that will raise an exception. And while we're at it, then we print out the string before and after packing so that there's a discrepancy, then we'll see it. OK, so this is 
So this is a, a traditional test suite for these functions. Let me just compile that. Please? <laughs> yes. OK. And now I can run the tests. There we are. They all pass. So the code works, right? The test works. The test. <laughs> okay. So now we've seen a traditional looking test suite. Let's see what a property for testing this code looks like instead. Here it is, somewhere. Here it is. Here is an example of a quick check property. Um, I've called it prop identity. And um, what it says is that. For all messages, which are lists of seven-bit values, values between 0 and 127, if I pack the message and unpack it again, the result should be equal to the message I start off with. So quick check properties, or quick check builds upon Erlang, and um, quick check properties are just Erlang function definitions that make use of an API that quick check provides. And um, that API is an example of a language, a specification language, which we've embedded in Erlang in the same way that Satman described this morning. So you can just read this as a logical statement, right? For all messages in this set, then this property must hold. Let's see what happens when we test it. Now the nice thing about testing this is that uh, we will be able to generate any number of lists of 7-bit values, and so we're going to be able to run many more tests than uh, the traditional set of tests we've contained. So to test it, I'll just call quick check, and I'll give it the property as an argument. There we are. We just generated 100 random strings, um, packed them and unpacked them, and we got the identity in every case. So quick check testing also succeeds, and so the code works, naturally. No. Isn't that enough for you? Oh, well, okay. Maybe because we have a, a very suspicious person in the audience. Maybe I shall run some more tests then. How many would you like? 10,000? Why not? Oh, dear me. One of the tests failed. So when a test fails, then uh, the failing test case is printed out. What is the failing test case? If we look back at the property, it's the values of these for all bound variables that are the test case. So it's the message that is the test case. And uh, we know, then, that this randomly generated message causes the test to fail. Now, there's an awful lot of uh, junk values in there. After Quick Check has found one failing test case by random generation, something rather interesting happens. The tool starts to systematically simplify that test case and uh, see if we can find a simpler case that also fails. Now, in this case, the simplification consists of uh, trying to replace the numbers by smaller values and also trying to discard elements from the list. And we can see that actually, we were able to replace all of those numerical values by zero. So that suggests that those values don't matter. Um, but we weren't able to discard any elements. This has eight integers in the list, and uh, so does this. So obviously, there's something important about having eight elements in the list, because if I deleted one of those, and I just take, took seven zeros, then the test would pass. And I know that because if that test also failed, then Quick Check would have simplified the test case further. So I get a lot of information out of seeing what this minimized uh, failing test is. In the manual test suite, you have a seven element list? An eight element list. An eight element list. Well, yes, it did actually. So that suggests that maybe not all eight element lists fail. Very interesting. So we can now use Quick Check to explore the reason for this failure. For example, I suspect the problem is with messages of length 8. So let me just change the property. I'll say that if the length 
of the message uh, is not eight, then the property should be true. Okay, so now our property says, for all messages that aren't eight characters long, or if the length is not eight, that implies that the test should pass. Okay, and now I can just recompile and retest, and now it should pass. Those crosses, oh, well, look at that. So a dot is printed for every successful test. The crosses are tests that were generated, but not run, because they didn't pass that condition. And uh, this is another failing test case. It's not a length 8. Gosh, what length is it? 16. Oh. So maybe it's not just let, let messages to length 8 that fail. Maybe it's multiple to 8. Yeah, OK. So let's say if the length ren 8 is uh, greater than zero, then the test should pass. Ignore that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the airline cell that does that sometimes. OK, so now we're getting more tests that are multiple today. Oh, look, 10,000 pass. What are the exits? They're test cases that have been discarded, because that's a test case that is a multiple of eight. All right, 40,000 tests later, maybe we feel that this property might be true now. Actually, I can also uh, focus testing on the cases that I suspect fail. So I'll just put a true there for now. Let me replace this list by vector eight. So this will just generate messages of length 8. And I, I expect these to fail, but maybe I'll learn something by doing this testing even so. Let's recompile. Test. There we are. We failed, of course. But now we fail much more quickly. There's three failing test cases. OK, now, after shrinking, they all consist of eight zeros. But before shrinking, they're different. Do we notice anything in common between the failing cases? They all end in zero, don't they? Oh, well, maybe if the uh, last element is not equal to zero, then the test can pass. Let's try that. Woo! We seem to have tracked down the bug. So what I wanted to show you here is that we can use QuickCheck not only as a specification tool and a testing tool, but also as an analysis tool. We've learned a lot about the bug and the situation in which it arises. We haven't even had to look at the source code yet. So there's a lot of power here. OK. Now, this example is um, quite realistic. Uh, especially in telecoms, there are lots of coding, uh, encoding and decoding functions. And of course, a property like this should hold for all of them. So there's lots of real interesting testing that you can do with a property that looks very like this. But on the other hand, it's also a rather simple case because those functions have no internal state. And uh, unfortunately, although we functional programmers don't believe in it, <laughs> lots of software does have internal state. And so it's important, if we're to develop a general testing tool, to be able to test software with internal state as well. So I'm going to show you another example. I'm not going to do a demo, but I'm going to show you uh, what happens when we run this. Ooh, am I? No, first I'm going to explain what QuickCheck does. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got ahead of myself there. OK, so you've now seen QuickCheck in action. We start off with the specification, and uh, we use that to generate test cases. We execute the tests. When one of them fails, then we enter this simplification phase where we systematically run a lot of tests to see how much we can simplify uh, the thin case that has been found. And that results in a minimal counterexample to the property. And I just want to emphasize that this simplification phase is incredibly important when you start off with random test data, as we do with QuickCheck. Why? Well, because random test cases will contain a lot of noise. Random data always does. 
So when a randomly generated test fails, it's very likely that the majority of the data there has nothing to do with the failure. And uh, so if you start trying to debug uh, from an initial test case that, that was just randomly generated, you've got a lot of distraction there that will uh, delay finding the, you know, finding the source of the problem. In fact, the failure is probably called by a small part of the data, which we can think of as the signal. And what this simplification phase does is extract the signal from the noise. And uh, that is tremendously important. It automates the first stage of diagnosis of the failure. And I think it makes all the difference in the usefulness of random testing. Can I ask you, uh, the, way you uh, uh, the way you try to reduce, reduce the failure, or the, you try to pinpoint the error in the code, you did that, that by being very methodic, uh, methodical yourself. Mm -hmm. You said, well, it looks like length eight. Let's try that. And let's try. If there's a zero in all of these, let's try that. Have you ever considered a second simplification stage where you actually, because lists are lists and elements are elements, and if they're equal to your program, you see that? And you see what I mean? Well, so what, what we're trying to do is to put powerful tools in the hands of a person, but we're not trying to automate intelligence. So you know, the, the idea is that, that I or you should be able to use your creativity and intelligence, but not just without wasting a lot of time on tedious details. And I think we have quite a good compromise there. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the, the things you did was in a methodic, or whatever it's in English, methodic sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think uh, maybe it could be encoded in your program to do the same mm. deduction. Maybe, maybe. You can no, yeah. I think about it, we can um, always make yeah, it a little better. Okay. What do you mean by simplifier? Are you going to describe what the simplification process looks like? Is it just shortening this, the test case, the, the, the shortest size that's, that causes it to fail? What other criteria are applied? So it's domain specific. Okay. And when you um, define your own test data, then you also have an opportunity to define how it should be simplified. And we have a number of simplified simplification strategies built in. Um, and that's the ones for lists and integers do just what I described. But, um, so implicit in what you said was you know, shortest sequence, smallest values. Yes, okay. exactly. So what, what are the main simplification strategies you use? It depends on what kind of data we're simplifying. Because oh, okay. right, you have to simplify respecting the semantics of the data, exactly. whatever that is. Exactly. Um, and so, so it's hard to say in general. But you'll see, you'll see in a minute. I have another example. <laughs> Okay, state I was talking about. So I thought I wanted an example of uh, functions with state, an API with state, and I thought I'll take C file IO. I'll just take three functions F read, which reads a number of bytes from a file into a buffer, F write, that writes a number of bytes, and F seek, that sets the file pointer to a particular position. I hope these are familiar to lots of people. They're also so simple that there can be no surprises. Right? <laughs> so, how are we going to apply this approach to testing to uh, software like this? Well, now, we can't just test these functions in isolation, because before we can test you know, f write or f read, we have to set up the state of the file correctly. But if we've tested f write, you know, looking at the result that it returns, it's just a number of bytes that it wrote. That's not going to tell us whether it worked. We need to inspect the state of the file afterwards as well. So um, we need more complex test cases here. But actually, there's a very simple and powerful idea that um, makes it possible to test this kind of code very easily. And that is, the test cases that we generate are now not just simple data items, but they're sequences of calls. And we represent those symbolically. So we're generating symbolic test cases that are the sequence of calls that we want to make to the API on the test. The specification then becomes preconditions and postconditions for each operation, plus a declarative model of the state. And the minimal counter examples that we find are going to be minimal call sequences that satisfy all the preconditions but violate some of the postconditions. So, of course, if we were testing software of this sort by writing automated test cases by hand, 
you would write sequences of calls. So we're just generating the same kind of test case. Gosh, I should be giving a talk in Stockholm. <laughs> OK, so now in order to test these things, I want to model the um, state of the file. And uh, to do that, I'm going to make use of Erlang's data types and, um, and functions to construct a very simple declarative model of what these functions are supposed to do. So how shall I model the contents of the file? Well, a list of bytes is a very natural model. And uh, Erlang has some very useful list processing functions that make defining this kind of model quite easy. For example, one that splits a list at a position n. What does that do? Well, splits the list into a prefix and a suffix. <laughs> I didn't know it would be so easy to impress. <laughs> I'm doing PowerPoint to it. <laughs> so it splits the list into a prefix and a suffix, and the result of the function is just a pair of those things. Here's a little Erlang notation for those who aren't familiar with it. These curly brackets um, create a pair, that is a data structure with two components, the prefix and the suffix. OK. So how can I model reading? Well, when we read from a file, we're reading at a particular position, and we try to read a certain number of bytes. And I can model that by taking the list of file contents and just splitting it up twice. So first of all, split the position. That gives me x. That's the first line of code. Second one splits x at the length. And that gives me the result. So that was easy. Modeling a right, I don't have such fancy animations for this, but it's very similar. So this model's inserting a string of data, a list of bytes, at a position in a file. And first of all, we split the file up into a prefix and the rest at the position. Then we split the rest at the length of the data to get well, the bytes that will be thrown away and the suffix. And then we just put them together with the data. There's one subtlety in writing files in C, and that is, it's possible that the position here is beyond the end of the file. And do you know what happens if you write beyond the end of the file? No, no, it doesn't crash. The file is extended with zeros. Up to that point, this is perfectly defined. So that's what the yellow bit there is doing. It's just extending the prefix up to position with zeros. So now I've got a functional model of what these things are supposed to do. Um, I want to show you some quick check code fragments. How many will depend on my time? Oh, not as many as I thought. <coughs> so, of course, I need to write some quick check code to generate the test cases. And uh, here is the generated <laughs> commands. Um, it uses a quick check function well off that just chooses from a list of alternatives. And you can see I'm choosing between Erlang data structures that are symbolic representations of calling fread, fwrite, or fseek. So that's exactly what I have to write for that. Then I have to write a state transition function to model the effects. <coughs> Here is one clause of the state transition function for um, fwrite. And now I'm modeling the entire file as these op operations operate by a contents and a position in a record. So this first line here is just taking the state and pattern matching it to extract the contents L and the position POS. And the second two lines, it would be one line, my lines weren't so short, the second line uh, is returning the new state of the file in which the contents have been modified using insert, which we just saw, and the position has been increased by the length of the data. So there are another couple of clauses and also pre and post conditions. And we end up with a very simple declarative model of what these functions are supposed to do. Skip those. So to my surprise, um, things didn't turn out exactly as I expected. Here's the first problem I ran into. And uh, this is the kind of output that QuickCheck produces. It's now a list of Erlang terms that represent the symbolic test case. It may not be so easy to read, so I have translated it into 
uh, a more readable notation for you. Basically, what this test case is doing is seeking to position one, writing an entry string, seeking back to zero, and then reading one byte. Something goes wrong. Let's see what happens. OK, we start with an empty file. We seek to position one. Now we, we write the empty string. OK, writing the empty string is a little off, maybe. But what happens when we write beyond the end of the file? It's extended for zeros, right? Now we seek back to the beginning. And now we read one byte. What do we expect to get? Zero. But we don't. Here is the actual output from these commands. And that last read returned zero bytes. And, well, there's a list that doesn't contain any bytes. So in other words, I said read one byte, and read said there aren't any bytes there. So this test case is executed by generating and running C code. Oh, okay. right. So this is what the C code has returned. Oh, okay. So the model returns zero. The Allen model returns zero. Yeah, the Allen model says you should get zero here. Yeah. But the C code didn't read anything. Why not? Well, there is a fix. And the fix is I wrote zero bytes. Writing zero bytes does not cause null padding of the file. So I have to update my specification to take account of that. Here's the modification. It's just got a case that inspects the data, and if there are no bytes in it, it leaves the state unchanged. Actually, the situation is more complicated than this. Uh, write is supposed to do several other things apart from zero extend the file, and it doesn't do any of them if you write zero bytes. I have not found this behavior documented anywhere. So, OK, it's perhaps reasonable that writing zero bytes shouldn't do anything. But at least the documentation should say that zero is a special case. Have, have you tried that with digital operators? I've even tried it in Haskell. Same thing happens. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> does what Unix does. <laughs> so anyway, I fixed that. And then I got this problem. OK, well, this is a little, little bit more complicated. I have an animation for you again. Let's see what it does. We start with an empty file. We write two zeros. That's the first line. OK? We know what that does. We seek back to the beginning. Now we read one byte. That means the file pointer there. Now we write another zero. Well, that shouldn't change anything, of course. Then we seek back to the beginning again. And then we try to read three bytes. What do we expect? Two zeros, of course. But what we get is three zeros. <laughs> so I was very baffled by this. In fact, I found other examples as well, where I wrote a one into the file. And then I read that byte, and it wasn't there. But the write had succeeded, so it had written one somewhere. There's a one somewhere on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I wanted to find a way to fix this. And the fix was to give preconditions that restrict what calls you're allowed to make. And here is the fix. Let me show it to you. You're not allowed to do a read after a write. You're not allowed to do a write after a read unless you're at the end of a file, unless there is a seek between the read and the write. OK. If you add this to the spec, the tests pass. Oh, but your example has seeks everywhere. No, it didn't. Here oh, is a read followed by a write, not at the end of the file, without a seek in between. Remember, this is a minimal example that provokes this failure. So all of these operations are necessary to make the code fail. So I ask you, is this reasonable behavior? I certainly don't think so. I mean, this, I regard this as a piano wire stretched across the road at neck height. <laughs> but of, of course, if you're reading and writing a file, and you know that the file position is already in the right place, why should you do a seek? But if you don't, then you get very weird behavior. So I thought, there must be a bug in my GCC or SQL or whatever. But no. 
This is in the C standard. That's the only place that I've found this documented. If you read, you know, the kind of introductory documentation of these five functions, they don't say anything at all about this. What's more, nobody else spoken to knows about it. <laughs> and yet, it's in the standard, and I've discovered this behavior with the help of quick check testing. Okay, I want to show you one real bug before handing over to Graham. Uh, this is from testing Ericsson's media proxy. It's my favorite bug of all time. Um, the media proxy, for those who don't know about it, is a product for multimedia IP telephony, and it basically connects calls across a firewall. And it's controlled by a separate box, the media gateway controller, that sends commands to open and close media pinholes to allow just that IP traffic through that corresponds to calls in progress. And we tested sequences of commands that included adding and removing callers from the call. So you can add any number of callers in the, the protocol to a call, but the media proxy is restricted to two, and that's quite important. So here's a test case of failed. You add the first caller to a call, that creates the call. You add a second caller. Now, because the proxy is restricted to two callers in the call, the call is now full. So we can't add a third. But we can subtract one. Now, it's not full. So we can add a third now. The call's full. But we can subtract one. Now, it's not full. So we can add a fourth. And now we can subtract the fourth. Boom. <laughs> Something crashed inside the proxy. So I love this bug for several reasons. One is that it really illustrates the power of shrinking very well. Our initial test case was 160 commands long. And of course, nobody could have drawn any conclusions from that. But when it's reduced to just these seven, then it's possible to diagnose the problem and understand what's going on. Another reason I love this bug is that Nobody in their right minds would test this with a handwritten test case. Right? I mean, there are more than just add and subtract commands in this protocol. There are 12 different commands. You can't test all sequences of seven commands. Um, so why test this one? It's obvious. If you can add and subtract something once, and you can add and subtract something twice, then by induction, you can do it any number of times. Can't you? Are you going to define this the simplest sequence, or...? No, it depends on um, which test case you hit first. So it's worth running it several times to so pick the simplicity. Yeah. Okay, so it's a bug that could not reasonably be found by manually written test cases. You might also say, well, it's never going to happen in practice, which is no doubt true. But this is just a symptom. The fault happened there. The first time we subtracted a caller, and every time a caller was subtracted, some internal data structures were corrupted. And it just so happened that if all you did after that was, you know, proceed up to this point, then the code survived. But by continuing with this sequence, it was possible to provoke a crash out of these corrupt data structures. And it's not good to have corrupt data structures in the system. Like, you know, next year, somebody could have modified the code. Of course, they would assume that the system that has been working so long had proper data structures in it, but it's not true. Um, let me skip over this too, actually. I think what I will do now is hand directly over to Graham, who will tell you about some more real examples of... Whoops. ...of testing a quick check.